How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another wild episode of our Don't Get Mad, Get Evidence Roundtable, uh, trashing myths throughout pro, the pro audio world. Uh, and as always, we've got Pipeline with us and we've got Mr. Ethan Weiner as well. How's it going, guys? What's happening? Ready for this, I hope. What a couple of ad livers. Holy shit. <laughs> 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 anyway, okay, it's uh, it's really great to be back here with you guys. Uh, now we've taken a, we've looked at a few things over the last couple episodes. The first one did pretty good. The second one we talked about acoustics and didn't quite get the feedback we were looking for. Although we did stumble ac- across a couple of really cool ideas. So actually, yeah, and uh, isn't that a really important thing to point to bring up? Is that well, every single time we talk about gear, people don't want to talk about acoustics. They want to talk about crap that doesn't matter. The acoustics matter. Yeah, the acoustics matter the most. Those are probably the single most important uh, investment you can make in your home studio is acoustics. But we're not even here to talk about acoustics today. I mean, like, if you're wondering what the fuck we're talking about, go watch the last episode where we like did like 45 minutes on acoustics and you know why you should invest in some, you cheap motherfucker. And uh, instead, we uh, we're talking about some other stuff. Actually, on, on a side note of that, um, I I did a before and after video with a buddy of mine down in San Diego. He dropped seven grand in acoustic treatment into his home studio. And which is also doubles as his drum room. And we do a before and after just showing what happens. And uh, the toms just magically came alive in the bottom end. <laughs> it's pre- pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, that video is coming up for those of you guys who are wondering about that. But yes, today I wanted to talk about something that's been a big subject and a, and a point of controversy on my show over the last couple months. And that is guitar manufacturing. UA, USA versus overseas in the Far East where labor's cheaper. Uh, because that seems to be a big sticking point for a lot of guys. I'm kind of curious to get some feedback from uh, from these guys who have some experience in manufacturing overseas. Aaron, uh, you in particular, Mike was mentioning you had something going on over there. Yeah, Mike, Mike really handled most of that stuff. He had some stuff done in China. But as a owner of a music school, one of the things that really is huge is, is making sure that your students have instruments. During the Backstreet Boys reunion tour, um, Korea especially went through some trouble uh, because they, they were they were pretty proactive about keeping their workers healthy. And one of the main, I, I think a lot of people might know this and may not, one of the main guitar manufacturers there is for any brand you can think of is in Korea. They're called World Music Instruments or World Musical Instruments. They make pretty much everything, and they 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 do an unbelievable job of it. Yep, I've got a. There you go. There's a there's a Korean ESP. I got a. Um, oh, it's. I just reviewed this thing. It is lovely. It is probably my favorite guitar, and believe me, I own a shit ton of guitars. This is just absolutely magnificent. They did such a beautiful job with it. What do you got? <laughs> I got a, I got my ESP. This is one of the last ones made in Korea. Uh, Chicago Music Supply found it for me. There weren't really, there wasn't much stock left. Okay. And the way I heard it was um, they uh, are moving most of it to Indonesia. And um, as they retire, their older workers and the newer workers had a chance to either work at the factory in Korea or manage the factories in Indonesia. Okay. And so most of the more ambitious younger people took on the manufacturing in Indonesia part. And... Um, We've seen some of the um, Harley Benton guitars that came out of those factories. Yep. And they they look awesome. They they look just as good as the Agiles and some of the other stuff that I know a lot of people turn their noses up to, but these are guitars that would have cost you five grand in the 80s when gas was 50 cents a gallon. That's um, true. Yeah, speaking of Indonesia, here's an Indonesian-made solar. I just got this a couple weeks ago. It's light. It's beautiful. It just plays brilliantly. Um, it's it's almost as good as the LTD. It might actually be better. I don't know. I'm kind of switching back and forth as as to which one is my favorite. So so there you go. Well, one thing I can tell you about the the world music uh, employees um, is that they're fanatics. There, there's a video where they asked this one. This lady looked like a grandma. You know, she knew what what the guitar was going to do, and she flashed the devil horns and started making the Floyd Rose symbol. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I guess she knows. Right on. And, and it. Every time you watch one of these videos, it looks like they're having to rip the guitars out of the workers' hands. Like they, they really put some <laughs> some effort into these things, and I'm not surprised that the Indonesian ones are turning out really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've heard some some complaints, some gripes on online, at least secondhand anyway, about some issues with some cracked fretboards on some of the solar models, like right around uh, where the uh, where the fret marker is. But 
I mean, like, that's probably, you know, you can't really do too much about that when you, you know, you're stuffing 100 guitars into a shipping container, you know, sailing it across yeah. the Pacific. I mean, like, it's going to happen. I mean, like, doesn't matter what you do. Yeah, but there's um, going to be some bad ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your take on all this, um, Ethan? Uh, you know, I don't really have a take or an opinion. This is not really my subject. I could tell you everything about how electric guitars work, <laughs> you know, and. <laughs> And all the okay, okay. Well, about. I'm not just talking about guitars, though. I'm talking about other things too. I'm talking about you know uh, manufacturing converters and microphones and all that stuff too, because a lot of that stuff we're buying is coming out of China. Everything, um, yeah. pretty much. You know. Yeah, I, I'd say pretty much everything. Yeah. And, and one of the big issues for me is that um, once yeah, there you go. That's another so one. It's, uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's let's find the English. Hold on. Let's say anything. No, it doesn't say where it's actually manufactured. Hmm. Now, you guys recommended this on the last episode, so I actually broke down and bought one. That's right. And, yeah, so I'm going to reach out to Vern Grainer if you really want to see that thing go crazy, man. That, okay. that guy is just the master okay. of that thing. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Well, you know, that was the thing. Ethan was kind of going off about this thing and saying how great it was. So I thought, okay, why not do a review on this? This will be yeah. kind of fun. It's cheap. It cost me 127 Canadian dollars. That's about well. thir- that's about 39 cents in U.S. in the U.S. box, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> You know, one of the things we're seeing uh, with China is that, and I don't know if this is official, but this is how it ends up happening every single time, and, and people can argue with me until they're blue in the face, but once you have something manufactured in China, that design, that intellectual property becomes China's intellectual property, and every single business there, it seems like, has access to that property now, so anybody can print the exact same thing you just made, and... Uh, that's great for us musicians because we get now we get super cheap gear for uh, you know really copies of good stuff that could be or could could be good or could be bad. Um, but in a lot of times it's really good. I just uh, I just I just had a, a Line Six wireless fail on me in its very first use. Got to go blank screen and everything, and then I see that Joyo's got a thirty dollar. One of those like guitar dongle wirelesses. I'm like, uh-huh. well, hold on, just spend the thirty bucks, you know. Yeah, um, those are, those are fun. I've actually demoed a bunch of those different wireless systems, and they're fine yeah. as long as you're not in a crowded room with everybody, you know, comp- competing for the same wireless band. Then it gets yeah. interesting. <laughs> well, there's, you know, I I ordered a 2.4 gigahertz version and a 5.8 gigahertz version, and there you go again. Because of this China stuff, I didn't have to make a choice. I could just buy two of these things because they cost peanuts. But at the same time, there there, there are there are costs from. Um, doing that a lot of people don't want to invest in the intellectual property anymore um it's hard to know if you're getting something good or something bad and almost every device out there uh because china can print audio interfaces all day long and if everybody's using thesicon or the sicon de whatever however you pronounce that those are the same drivers that are used in just about every usb interface as long as you put out an interface these drivers are available to you already and um it, it's just ready to go. But do you know, is that, is that interface going to be good? Is it going to blow up? Is it, um, you know, yeah. well, it, that, that, it's, it's that's really the thing. Hard. I've got, I've got a couple of interfaces from some Chinese manufacturers that look suspiciously an awful lot like some focus right gear. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you yeah. know, and you know that's the price you pay for for building your stuff over there. Yeah, but yep. you know, but that's dishonest. It's unethical. You know, I mean, to steal somebody else's design, make a clone. At least if they sell it, you know, like the counterfeit SM fifty sevens. I mean, that's that, that's dishonest. I mean, that's you know, that's not good. Well, and For they're anybody. fucking terrible anyway. I've uh, yeah. I've def I've uh, I've shot out the the Behringer uh, MB seven. No, I have shot out the Behringer mic, the one they put out last year that looks just like a fifty seven. It was awful. Uh, the Toman MB seventy fives actually aren't half bad. They're definitely not fifty sevens. They've kind of got their own frequency curve going on for guitar. They're a little bit slightly different flavor, but they're pretty good actually. But uh, the Behringers were just downright awful. And then you get the pile ones, which are like five bucks, and <laughs> yeah, they sound like a five dollar microphone shit. They're well, just I, I meant more the counterfeit. I, I meant more counterfeit things. I mean that's. Yeah. I mean that's really unethical. Well, we're, yeah. we're we're you know they're not. They're. It's actually politically incorrect to say counterfeit at this point. Like if they steal your stuff, you're supposed to take it. I mean, <laughs> it's. It's kind. Of, it's kind of like if you get in these arguments online, it's kind of silly. But I'm not going to say specifically sure or whatever. But it is the case that. A lot of these uh, counterfeits or, or clones or whatever are nothing nothing of the sort. They just weren't paid for by that particular person. 
the same people who are building all the stuff can sell the same stuff they're building and just not put your name on it. And it's exactly the same product, but you don't know that. It could be a total piece of crap and right. you wouldn't know. But there's plenty of cases, and I remember there was a very big one between two different, a very expensive mic manufacturer and a very cheap one where this exact same thing happened and one guy claimed that they were making their mics in Europe and they weren't being. And so because they were claiming that, the other company put out a hundred dollar mic that was exactly the same mic because it was getting printed out of the same factory yes and the I, big I, company I, couldn't say anything i remember that and uh i think that mic brand started with the t that's right i remember that's that exactly yeah exactly right you open up and it's the exact same thing and then uh it showed up in canada under the apex brand at long and mcquade's and it was basically the same freaking thing yep and then yep. the then the i mean this was like if you ever get an that's going that's outside. going back 10 15 years now oh yeah yeah, but, that, but this is this is just us establishing how it's going to work. And if you ever get into the, I know somebody's going to get mad, the creation evolution debates and stuff, you will see the exact same apologetics used by the uh, by the this time the 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 T brand was saying stuff that was epistemologically so bankrupt to try and differentiate that mic from the other mic when when they knew and everybody else knew there was really nothing that could be done. Mm -hmm. to, to make that point because it wasn't true. Right. Yeah, it's like, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, that's not saying that T-Brand doesn't make some of their own cool stuff. I've, I've definitely played with one of their snare mics that was very, very nice. Uh, I got my buddy down in San Diego, the one who we did the acoustic things with. He absolutely swears by that. So so there you go. But um, try to get some, Ethan into this conversation. Come on, yeah. Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> yo, what? Um, yo, here's the thing. Okay, European mics versus made in China. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, microphones are revered, and people obsess over microphones. And when you held up that microphone before, did you point out that that's the Audio Technica 2020? Yes. That I, yeah. Yeah. This is the this is the AT 2020. This is the one Ethan swore up and down about on the last episode. So I thought you guys yeah, deserve a me. fearless gear review on this. So I'm going to. Uh, yeah, you don't count here. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. No, no, no. You both swore up and down about this thing, and I'm like, I, I've got a personal favorite too. I love the uh, the Lewitt 240 Pro, which is like 150 bucks, uh, designed uh, in Austria, made in China, that kind of stuff. Fabulous, Mike. Um, and I've got a feeling these two are kind of like probably cut from the same cloth, and I would imagine, you know, are fairly similar in their design. You know, in, in, internally anyway. I, I don't the the mic body is definitely going to be different, but uh, sure, why not? What do we get here anyway? I mean, like. So this is what ninety nine bucks U S. I got this for one hundred and twenty seven Canadian, and you know we get a we get a pouch, and we get this little mic. I did a shootout of like five ninety nine dollar mics last year, or five mics under hundred bucks last year, and I was pretty underwhelmed actually. Uh, the Samson mic in particular was just fucking dog shit. Um, oh. But you guys are swear you guys swear by this one, and yeah, it looks like a one inch one and a half inch diaphragm condenser, you know. Yeah, yeah, speaking of which, can you if you're looking at that capsule, does that look like an actual capsule or an electric? I can't tell. It's very dark and everything's uh, backlit. I, I think it's because actually because there are those How it, can I tell? It's uh I, I think it's actually about a half an inch uh uh diameter uh diaphragm. It's it's okay. not but it's, it's a real it's a real diaphragm, not an electric diaphragm. You know, I I, I, I honestly don't know. It requires forty eight volt phantom power. Um Okay. But that doesn't really mean anything. What's the because? Okay, okay. For those of us who don't know, what's the difference between a, a full diaphragm and an electric? Well, well, it's not full di. I mean, they both have diaphragms. The uh, a, a a phantom powered well, a, an electric mic has a permanent charge. In order to be a capacitor microphone, the way that works is there are two plates right next to each other, really, really close. They're metal, you know, two two circles. There's one that's Often it's like mylar, metalized mylar. So it's really thin and flexible piece of plastic that can, uh, you know, that can vibrate up against a metal back plate. And they're really, really close. And those two mm -hmm. things of metal, the metal that's bonded to the uh, mylar plastic for, and also the other piece of metal, the solid piece, it's near, it's like the size of a half dollar or a quarter or whatever, uh, right next to it. Those form a capacitor. They're not touching. And, right. uh, but if, if you hook up two wires, they're not going to. It's not going to generate audio. Uh, you need to apply a DC voltage of at least yep. 20, 30 volts, something like that. And now there's a charge between them, and as the 
well, it's, it's really, I think, the conservation of energy principle. Uh, there's, uh, as the sound waves move closer and closer, the capacitance changes, and that that, that then creates uh, the, the varying voltage. So right. an electric mic is permanently charged, and I actually don't know how they do it. It's some, to me, it's a magical principle, but I know it's sealed so that the capacitance doesn't drain, the charge doesn't drain over time, okay. or it doesn't drain much anyway until you get okay. to 20, 30 years old. Uh, but the old school microphones like U47, U87, uh, actually power, they, they provide 48 volts or 60 volts or whatever to to the two, you know, DC, to these two pieces of metal. And uh, uh, and that's, so that's, but you need to have a charge. If you don't start with a DC voltage, there's nothing to vary as the plates mm. get closer and cl closer and farther. Uh, you know, from the sound waves. I hope, I hope that was clear. Okay, yeah. Okay, so clear as mud. Uh, yes, yeah. obviously <laughs> the difference between a, 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 a full capsule and, a, and an electret is fuck the fino. <laughs> well, no, no, it's just that they, yeah. they, they charge, you know, if you have a capacitor, which is a, a component, I might even have one right here in front of me here. Oh... Uh, no, Which we can't see right now, by the way, because <laughs> well, no, I know you can't see. A, a capacitor is a, a capacitor is an electronic component that's made of two pieces of metal close together. Often it's okay, yep. uh, often it's strips of aluminum foil, like half inch wide, like a foot long. And uh, but instead of putting them together, they put it they put a piece of saran wrap in between. So right, right. Oh, I get I get the whole principle. Yeah, it's like yeah. So they, you're, they, you're saying they, they the they electric mic is. No, Hang on but, a second. But no, but I'll, I'll explain. They roll it up okay. to save space, so it's the size of your right. pinky or something, and then they uh, dunk it in epoxy or something, kind of goo that hardens, and you can charge that up if you apply a battery to a capacitor and then take the battery right. away. You can measure a voltage across it. Eventually, that voltage right. will drain off. But if you hook it up to a light bulb, you charge up the capacitor, then connect it to a light bulb, the light bulb will flash briefly until the capacitor discharges. So an electric mic, right. they just permanently charge it, and it stays there. I guess they seal okay. it in wax or some kind of airtight something so that uh, nothing okay. drains off the charge. Okay, but... But it's that you know it's it's not magic. But you still got but you still got to apply forty eight volts to it regardless. Well, well, no, that's because no the the phantom power and doesn't necessarily have to be forty eight volts. Uh, okay. uh, it needs to. Uh, that's to power the preamp because a condenser uh, mic okay. needs a preamp. Uh, a, a dynamic so, so mic. So that's the thing. A dynamic mic is like a, that. a dynamic yeah. mic is like a speaker. It's got a coil, wire, a magnet, yep. and when the you know, thing hooked up to the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm and the little plunger into the coil that actually generates uh, electricity at a low impedance. It can actually drive some real current. It could drive a hundred feet of of XLR cable uh, okay. with, without a problem. A condenser mic is super high impedance, like gig ohms. So you need mm -hmm. special electronics to buffer that. You either a tube or an FET uh, uh, transistor. Uh, and that needs power. So that needs at least five, six volts of power, uh, 12 volts, whatever they, you know, however they design it. So that's okay. why even electric mics still need phantom power or a battery. Some of them have an option. They'll be opening it up inside. There's a switch. I think uh, I used to have, I think it was a U87 would run off a couple of 22 volt batteries uh, or phantom power. And there's a little switch. You open up the thing and yeah, I've got I've got a vintage U87. There's actually a slot inside for batteries. Yep. Yeah, You're yeah. So, right. uh, but that's also I think to to bias the you know the capacitor itself as well as okay. power the electronics. Okay. Okay. So okay, so we're powering the preamp, not not necessarily the capacitor. Yeah, so let me okay. let me interject that because this is this is one of these myths that comes up all the time. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, okay. So yeah, this is this is one of those myths that comes up on the forum all the time where people will say, oh, if can you hear it without phantom power? Uh, or do you need phantom power? If you need phantom power, then it's a real condenser. <laughs> and yeah. the, right. Right. it's not true. That, because like Ethan said, often the, the phantom power is there to power the preamp, not, the, mm -hmm. not to charge the capsule. So just because you need phantom power doesn't mean it's a, it's a, it's a capsule. But the, the reason or the, that it's that kind of condenser capsule. But the reason I'm even asking is because... Very similar to the look of the 2020, um, there's piles of mics on Amazons, and there's videos about them, mm -hmm. um, of these $20 mics. They usually go by names like BCM or Newer or whatever. Yep, yep, yep. I and bought one of those. 
I, I really no, they, embarrassed they're... myself because I had it facing the wrong way when I tried it out, and everyone's uh-huh. like, "You got it wrong, you moron!" I'm like, "Yep, <laughs> I got it wrong." Still sounded like dog shit, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, and those are some of those are electrics, but but yeah. I know there's another electric mic that sounded good. I'm trying to remember which one it was, but it was a small mic. It was really popular. Uh, now I forget, but there, there's it, it's not that electric mics have to sound bad. It's just that um. There's a there's a stigma, and so people have this this whole myth built around it that oh, as long as you can put fan and power on, then it's a real mic. Okay, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um. Oh yeah, I'm gonna retract the statement. No, it wasn't the problem with the Samson mic. This one was okay. This was like ninety nine dollars. It was the um. What the hell is this? The PreSonus mic. My my apologies. The PreSonus was absolutely fucking terrible. It was like it sounded like one of those cheap Chinese condensers you were actually talking about with a better packaging around it. Um, it just looked slightly nicer, but it was just horrid, well, absolutely know, awful. Well, I'll say one of the expensive mics I have is a DPA forty ninety. Uh, that was okay. like six hundred and fifty bucks, and that's an electric. It's got one of those tiny tiny diaphragms. You know, it's like a quarter right. a quarter of an inch in diameter. <clears throat> it's electric, and I've had it for 10 plus years, and it's still, you know, it's a measurement mic, a professional room measuring mic. Or right, yeah, mic. the D- the DPA guys, have been, we've been talking about doing something together for a while now. I think they're kind of neat. I hear they're actually really good for micing cabinets. It's just, yeah, they're these really, really, really tiny mics that you can fit in pretty much anywhere. And I am kind of curious to try them out and see what they can do. Yeah, it's interesting that in the in other industries, people use electric mics, electric mics, when it comes to needing to test and measure things, like to them, that's the accurate mic to use for for determining things. Mm. And I wonder if it doesn't have something to say to us because we all think we're the experts in the audio realm. But these guys are spending all the money to mm. find out what actually is the best thing to use to test with their bajillion dollar industries and stuff. And uh, there there may be a reason for that. And, and DPA has been making those tiny mics for forever. But and the thing not, is, you oh, it, it's not look. It's not that it's an electric mic. It's that the diaphragm is only a quarter of an inch in diameter. That's that's what makes it a room measuring mic. Uh, and it has to be omni, uh, you know, for, to do that. And and the smaller the diaphragm, the more omni it is, or the higher the frequency, it remains omni. You know, if you take a U eighty seven and set it to omni, it's got a one inch diaphragm. It's omni to, you know, I'm just guessing three kilohertz, five kilohertz, but it's not omni at 20 kilohertz. Uh, but these tiny, uh, okay. so it's the diaphragm size that affects the room measuring that determines whether it's good for room measuring more than. Well, I never knew that at all. I, okay. I just figured it was more sensitive, but less, uh, no, in less fa- noise it, rejection from the small ones. No, in fact, they're less sensitive. The signal to noise on a quarter inch diaphragm is much, much worse than on a one inch because there's so much less motion, you know, the same amount of air pressure. You know, there's very the capacitance, the starting capacitance is smaller because everything is so much smaller. So it's a struggle to get a good signal to noise ratio. Uh, Interesting. Okay. But, but, you know, we use we use these things as symbol mics and stuff like that, where where you're probably putting a pad on them anyway, so you don't need much sensitivity. But you do want you do want a good frequency response, which I think those smaller capsules it, it seems like they're always the ones that go 20 to 20 you know um, right. i was gonna say yes my absolute favorite drum mics ever are the earthworks series those are the ones with the really tiny little um capsules and they're magnificent and yeah they're just too damn hot you have to put pads on everything even before you get them into the preamps because they're just so fucking loud on drums but damn are they clean oh this sounds so good i bumped into them they AES 2018 or something like that in New York and actually their A&R guy at the time was actually from Windsor, Ontario. So we got chatting and I asked him about him. He said, well, we've never really tried him out on hard rock and metal before. Nobody has. <laughs> yeah, we've tried him out for jazz. So I'm like, so they sent me a set and they were like the coolest fucking things ever. I'm like, oh yeah, wow. let's do more of these because these are fucking great. So yeah, kind of kind of discovered that. That was a very, very nice discovery to make. They're just so great. I'm uh, I'm really thrilled with them. I've got some favorite drum mics. They're among my absolute favorites. They're, they're a really good stuff. We've got, we're really fortunate in this case, we've got a, a a wealth of choices when it comes to mics as well because of Chinese manufacturing because it's brought the price down. I mean, like condensers used to be like mega bucks when they were all made in Germany and shit, were they not? Right. Yes. Well, you know, and that's a funny thing though. If you read, so I'm not sure how true this is, but if you really dig into these mic manufacturers, it's not so much on there anymore, but 10 years ago, it's a lot easier to find this kind of stuff. If you really look at the about section and, and their, whatever they did translate to English on their, on their web pages, for instance, 797 Audio, if you're familiar with that yep. name for, for microphones. Yep, I had a Studio Project C1. Yep. 
there's a there's a claim on their about page that even before World War II, um, some of I think the Neumanns were being made. Uh, they were commissioned by 797 to make these these microphones. So it, it may be that the Chinese have been, and we're finding out in, in other industries that the, the Chinese have been building a lot of our stuff for a lot longer than we think, and, and we may just not have the right name of uh, origin of manufacturer printed on things for various reasons. But it, I think that the claim on 797 was that they were, by the late 30s, they were making microphones for some European companies. Very interesting. Okay, I had no idea about that. So there we go. And, and you know, it could be it could be state propaganda. I don't know, but uh, you, you would see uh, these claims on some of these. If if you go go on and dig in the uh, the mic manufacturing sites, and you'll see. And at the same time, you'll see crazy stuff like um, clip on mics, where they copied something pretty well. The mic works and everything, but then the way the clip on mic works for the tom, if you were to plug the XLR cable into it, you wouldn't be able to put the clip on. <laughs> like the, the, the XLR cable is in the way. You can't actually attach the mic to the clip. Well, do you, you remember what, where you in. saw that? What brand that was? I'd love to take a look at that. That's very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I have some pictures someplace. I've, I've posted them before. Mm. It's it's hilarious because if you go through, just like these guitar manufacturers, you can go on these sites and just pick out what you want. You can tell them, I want this capsule, I want, or I want this headstock, I want this thing, and. Um, it, it seems like, yeah, if you go on those and, and look through their mic catalogs, you're going to see some very funny choices that they've they've made when they make their own house brand versus when they're making it for somebody else. Well, yeah, we, we've seen a few of those show up in, um, once again, in Long McQuaid in Canada, some of the Apex mics. They're really not very good, a lot of them. I haven't been very impressed. But we've seen a couple of ribbons come in. We're just scratching our head like, what? You know, it's like you couldn't tell these were, des- you know, whoever went on the site and, you know, chose the components, did it for looks, not for how it's going to sound. We're like, well, that's not going to fucking work. You know, it's what what the fuck were they thinking? Oh, but it looks cool. Ugh. This is what happens, you know, if you don't have some actual, you know, like knowledge behind behind things when you go to order them or you want something built. It's like microphones are not things you build to look cool. Well, some some people do. And, you know, one of the things that, that I worry about is uh, often... I don't know if it's arrogance. I don't know if it's pride, but but people will refuse to listen to their target market. And um, we had a friend when when Reaper was first coming out. Actually, our first time we went to the Nam show, and, and at least walked around as with the Reaper shirts on and stuff. Uh, one of our friends was representing a, a company that had some speakers and interfaces and mics out, and um, he kept telling them, "Hey, we we have to think about who this market is. We have to change these names." And I'm like, why are you so worried? You know, they, they, you know, well, let's see how this works. And I go to his booth, and the, and they're showing their studio monitors, which are pretty cool looking. They look the same as all the other powered monitors that were coming out at the time, the KRKs and stuff. And the um, the 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 printing on it says blow five. So these were the five inches, and and we're all looking at it like nobody wants a speaker that says blows on it. I mean, it was actually said blows, and he had told these guys, and they're like, "Well, you know, that's that's you're 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 the guy who sells this stuff. You're not the guy who makes this stuff." And I'm like, you know, have a little humility because uh, <laughs> nobody bought the, the speaker that said blows on it. So. Wow, yeah, that's like uh, it's like well, just just by that same same thing, you know. I remember that happened in Canada here in Newmarket. Um, some they changed one of the main names of the street because there was a large Indian community. They changed it to Lahore Road, which is a city in India, obviously. But <laughs> to say that out loud in English in Canada <laughs> does not mean a city in India. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same kind awesome. of thing. It's like someone didn't think that through. You know, yeah. it's like yeah, that's where I want to live. Where do you live? Six 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 Lahore Road. Your mom lives next door. You know, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so yeah, we were again. We were talking about the AT twenty twenty. Um, just the qual- overall quality of mics coming out of China these days is pretty fucking mind blowing, though. If you go with, uh, say, a more reputable brand name, is that what I'm looking for? Um, I'm sure you can find you know some dirt cheap stuff on Amazon too. I haven't had a chance to try out everything. I, I pulled up. I did a review on one of those U eighty seven clones last year for like ninety nine bucks, and it was horrible. It was, uh, I swear it was the same capsule that was in that, uh, that PreSonus that I did. And it got the hammer. It was just fucking awful. Um, unfortunately, I would love to find a bargain mic for kids. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to take your advice. Try this guy out. 
Uh, well, well, I think Ethan should be able to tell us. Um, I think one of the issues with a lot of these mics is that, again, they're they're copying certain parts, but they're not copying the entire philosophy. Oh. Now, Ethan, there's a pre-emphasis circuit or something, right, that makes these things too bright? Is that what it is? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not a real microphone expert. I mean, I know how they work, obviously. But um, you can certainly add, with just a resistor and a capacitor, really simple couple of parts, uh, pretty much any kind of a curve. You can add a presence boost at whatever high frequency you think people are going to want. Or, or your marketing people can say, oh, it helps cut through a mix. Of course, a flat mic with the same EQ would give you exactly the same results as putting the EQ into the mic. But um, the, certainly the size and shape and spacing and all that of the diaphragm will affect the frequency response. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how all that works, but I know it's not like speakers with speakers. It has to be like 12 inches to get, you know, 20 hertz out of it. Uh, uh, and with microphones, even those quarter inch, tiny, tiny diaphragm microphones uh, will give you, you know, 10 hertz, 12 hertz, whatever. So uh, it's, it's not that same principle. So, um, but yeah, but they can do anything they want. I mean, with circuits, it's not complicated at all to add, okay. you know, a, a, you know, a, a high pass filter, you know, low cut or, or trouble boost or, or even when they change patterns, so that's a little more complicated inside, uh, you know, the microphones that have a switch to go from omni to cardioid or, or super cardioid or figure eight. I think there was a, there was some, I'm, I'm not a thousand percent sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what it was is the, um. The older mics were a little bit thicker of a diaphragm and um, weren't quite, they were tilted a little bit, maybe a little bit more rolling off on the high end. And mm. as these manufacturing got better and the, the capsules got thinner and thinner, because we got some thin, like, what is it, three micron or six micron mics now? Um, that's going to that's gonna change the tilt of the treble a whole lot. So if you just copied the old circuit, uh, you end up with these, what, what everybody calls spitty mics, like all these, these, um, cheap condensers you can buy from everybody and they always talk about how spitty and brittle and all that stuff but really that's just because it's using the the circuit to to for an older duller diaphragm and they don't really oh. understand that you should be using a different and then if you look at studio projects and stuff they're not they're not just copying the same old um or studio projects studio electronics any of those guys they're 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 taking into that they're taking that into account and they don't sound they don't have that weird bright yeah. thing but i actually kind of like that bright thing sometimes so I don't Some, know. sometimes it works yeah of course i i actually again that se uh 99 mic was in the was in the um was in my little shootout as well it wasn't half bad it sounded pretty good but it had this horrible resonance the uh the actual uh mic body would resonate and the capsule would pick oh, it up so it's like oh shit yeah here's the thing here's your hardware store five dollar fix for so much stuff so many of these cheap mics especially this was Totally on these MXLs when those things came out. Okay. You just go to the hardware store and there's this stuff that here it is right here. This material right here that you put on the end of your pliers or whatever, it, it comes in a little yeah can bucket, plastic dip or whatever. Just take a chopstick and just line the inside of your mic about because that those things you can talk next to your mic and hear your mic body ringing. If you really a lot of these thinner mics, you you can do it. You just talk to it or play a guitar next to them, you'll hear the body. And if you put the tool dip junk on the inside of it, you got tons of space in there. Um, they shut up. Come and on! It actually changes the handling noise a lot too when you're when you're moving the mic uh, around on the stand. Okay, okay. I think I just found a, a new subject for a video. <laughs> That's really cool. Okay, I think I'm gonna do that. Let me write this yeah, down. Yeah, it's That's five dollars and some chopsticks. What, what, what the hell is Hawaii what's chopsticks are cheap. Well, yeah. What? Pff, look, what's guys. the name of that stuff? I think it's called plastic dip or tool dip or something. Okay. Let, me, let me look. Well, you, you tool know, dip. There are affordable mics that are very, very good, like the Audio Technica stuff. Those are not cheap knockoffs of other stuff. Those are really high right. quality things, and they have some expensive stuff too. Uh, you know, many hundreds of dollars, but but their inexpensive mm -hmm. stuff is very, very good. I don't think they have resonating mic, you know, microphone you know, cases. Okay. None of the stuff I have. Yeah, is so like I see. I see plastic dip. Um, but any any hardware store will have this stuff. Okay. And you, it's really to dip your tool handles in, and, and man, it. But I, I just want to get it on the inside. Of, yeah. Oh, yeah, you'll see these guitar players on these forums. Well, they'll 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 take their their tremolo springs and they'll stretch them apart, 
with the with the vice, mm-hmm. and then they'll pour that junk all in it and let it dry, and then they take it out of the vice and it's a spring again. I'm like, does that really hold up? But apparently, the stuff is strong as all hell and it mm. stays on the springs. I just some people don't don't like that tremolo spring noise. Yeah, I just usually you know stuff a hair scrunchie underneath. I don't think you've carried one of those for years, but you know whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you had to do a lot of tweaking on our end if you wanted it to be good, and it just it it just didn't seem worth it to me in the end to the amount of work that it took to turn these mics good. But nowadays, that you can you it's actually easier to pay for QC now over there, and um, you could probably pull it off pretty well. I, I I have a lot of problems with with this type of thing, but um, it it in technically not to get into the feelings or politics. Uh, the Chinese are capable of putting out whatever we want because they are putting out whatever we want. Right. Okay. Fix. Which one is that? That's the SE mic. I think I've still got that SE mic kicking around downstairs. I think that'll be a cool, cool uh, mic to revisit then. Um, yeah. SE mic. I'm gonna go look for that. That might be a fun video to do just to see. Okay, here's the problem. Like I said, I thought the mic sounded great, but the resonance of the body was just horrible. So yeah, I didn't know you could actually do that. I, I'm. I was wondering. You know, it's like I thought. Okay, I'm just. This thing's just gonna be destined for the garbage heap. But if not, that's yeah. fucking cool. I would definitely want to try that out. Now, now that's a that's a very big caveat of if that matters. I'm I'm trying to make sure that's not some kind of tone wood nonsense because oh, yeah, God. sure the the guitar the guitar does sound acoustically a certain way, but does that matter to the electrics? But no. in my case, when I th- these mics would feed back until you did this, like the 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 hand it was going like you could feel okay. it, and once once the volume came up. Well, and, no, I'm um, I'm talking. You could hear the mic resonating in the actual pickup of the microphone itself. Yeah, I mean, it, it was would, that it would bad. make this fluty, kind of fluting kind of yeah. sound, almost comb filter weirdness that mm-hmm. I, I didn't think it would matter that much. But then when you think that cap, that can, capsule's attached to it and it's shaking whatever you're shaking. So it's it's different than calling a pickup microphonic, um, mm-hmm. which it is, but it's not microphonic for the same reason. You know? Right, right, exactly. I, I get what you're going at. So you, you were going to put microphones out in North America that you had manufactured in China. Yeah, we we did for a little for a very short while. What was the and, name of the um, company? What was the brand? Um, I mean, it, it was just putting it out as like Pipeline Audio or something. Oh, okay, I, I, I can't remember. So I'm still supporting them. People still send them, and I, I send them back because oh. they they were they were a great platform to work on, just like those MXLs were back in the day. As long as you were willing to do all the electronics and. Um, mm. But doing all the electronics, it becomes an expensive mic all of a sudden. Uh, you know, yeah, so. well, okay, perfect example. Okay, I'm talking through an Octava MC012. I bought these at Guitar Center in uh, year 2001, actually. And this has been my main mic I've done my monologue with on pretty much almost every single episode I've done in the studio here. And it's phenomenal. I used to use them as drum overheads, but I had the electronics swapped out in about 2005. Michael Jolie um, was oh, wow. was doing a service on them, and I had him upgrade the electronics, and I did some A/B comparisons, and yeah, it was definitely worth the extra money. What what did it do? Uh, he well, he took out the shitty Russian capacitors and all the rest of the circuits, and just bumped them up for higher grade components. And it definitely did make an audible difference. No, this is I didn't have a testing thing to run it through. Um, I only found out about that on the first episode <laughs> of this. But um, I, I definitely, I, I ran it on some drum overheads, and I definitely heard some significant improvements in terms of clarity. You know what I mean? It's like they weren't quite as harsh, shall I say, maybe a little bit sibilant as well. Yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah. You know, that that's a guy, I, I don't know if he's still working anymore. I, I, I don't think I, so. I think he's still? retired. Because he, he was kind of one of those guys where, he would just tell you straight out, oh, I, 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 I'm not going to make that any better. And, and so he wouldn't do jobs that he didn't think he could improve things on, which sure. is pretty, pretty, in, a lot of integrity there. I really, yeah. I really, well, he, he used to, he used to have a, he used to have an operation called Octava Mod where he'd take some of the Russian mics and like just bump up the, uh-huh. the components and stuff. But again, you take, you'd open, I remember when I got these mics, I mean, like, yeah, they looked, they look pretty cheap, you know what I mean? And it's like the the case they came in was shit, but they sounded good, you know what I mean? And he just he just did make them better, and he explained the issues, what the issues were with the uh, the solid state components inside the mics that could be could be swapped out and whatnot. So um, yeah, I'm kind of he gets the kind of crap that Ethan gets, like when the, <laughs> especially the mic preamp guys. They hate him so much, you know. Really? Because you know, well, I mean, he's he basically he's selling mics, so he usually says, you know, like. If these two mic preamps measure the same, then you're going to get a bigger difference out of different mics right. that measure differently, right. which is a tautology, but nobody would even accept that statement. Sure. 
Well, it's like me. I'm trying to tell guitar players if, you know, worry about your speaker. <laughs> Yeah, you know, don't don't worry about your tone when your pickups all that shit. Worry about your speaker. That's the important part. And and, and if they doubt that, uh, just load up an impulse loader and yeah. play your amp and just switch speakers out and see which. It's the easiest bigger. thing to do. It's like, <laughs> yeah. come on, guys, this is not difficult. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Turn turn your tone knobs all you want and see yeah. if that makes any difference compared to just swapping out that speaker right away. You know. Yeah. Oh, oh, I can do that with an EQ. No, you can't. Jesus Christ. You, you could with the most powerful EQ in the universe, but not with yeah. the four band thing that comes on these amplifiers. Oh, you know? God. Or the it's time just... it would take you, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have seen some pretty good EQ learner things. I mean, like, again, this goes back to my whole quest for this certain German metal tone that a buddy of mine has. He's got this wonderful old angle cab from like the early 2000s. It's got this beautiful sound on it. It's some vintage thirties from that particular time frame, And I don't know what the hell was with these particular speakers, but they sound great. And I, they've never been able to make the vintage thirties sound the same ever since. Believe me, I've tried out enough models and I've been looking for some from that particular run. No luck yet, but Isotope has an EQ lifter kind of thing where it can learn. Uh, and then you can apply it to your tone. And while well, using the same mic, same, same speaker type and whatnot, I was able to take a sample of him because he was nice and nice enough to provide me some multi-tracks of this and apply it to my own guitar sound. And you look, the EQ isn't even different. There's like, you know, 12 dB boosts on certain frequencies and like 16 dB cuts on others. It's like, there's some serious changes going on, but it is damn, damn, damn convincing. The only thing is you can't do it in real time because there's just too much latency. No. I'm like, so I actually I've, bugged the Isotope guys. I'm like, can we make this a real time thing? Would that would that be possible? <laughs> so we'll see. And, and and there are. I've got a bunch of videos up where I'm I'm using EQ matching to to try and get uh, to make different amplifier plugins sound the same as each other. And um, there are some real time ones out there. Uh, they're not as necessarily detailed. And then uh, man, I mean Ethan can talk about this, but once you're once you're messing with that stuff in 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 zero latency time. Or I mean, are you talking minimum phase or linear phase? And and there's some there's a there's an issue. People don't like linear phase for low end. And um, what what is what is that? It's a pre ringing. The pre ringing. What, what in the world that, is that pre ringing, Ethan? It, yeah, it, that's the problem with linear phase generally at all frequencies. Is is the pre ringing? Uh, I, I I have heard that there are some places where linear phase does make sense, but I would sure never use it. Anything with a linear phase for audio production, I mean, to EQ a you know an electric bass or a, you know an overhead drum or anything, I would just never never use one. Uh, I have I have one uh, in in my audio expert book. I actually made examples so people could hear. Uh, I think I used a claves or some kind of percussion sound so that you could hear what the pre ringing sound likes sounds like. And instead of hearing that, you would hear with a regular. You hear whoop whoop whoop. I mean, it's you know. Uh, who, who needs that? And yes, masking will hide that. You know, so just because it's there doesn't mean you'll hear it. But why would you even want that stuff? And and the whole the whole the whole selling point of 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 linear phase is well, it doesn't have phase shift. That damaging phase shift. Well, there's nothing wrong with phase shift. It's it's part of nature, and it happens with every EQ. It happens with everything. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with phase shift. It's not damaging. It's not nasty, and it's totally benign. Uh, so, so they, you know, these people that sell this stuff make up a, a, a boogeyman and then they come up with a product that defeats the boogeyman and they sell it to people. <laughs> that, that, is, that is, that is, that is, that is capitalism to a T. Invent the problem it. and sell the cure. Oh yeah. Here's how to get uh Glenn's channel banned forever. That is exactly what the clock people are doing. These clock people right, are fanatics. This is a dangerous cult. I'm sick of them. They're all over every single freaking forum. Oh. Apogee got called out hard for what they did, and, and yet they still do this stuff. Yeah, Antelope is doing it. I am oh. so sick of these oh, clocks. Or, or are we talking zealots. about the guys who sell the master clocks, that kind of stuff? It's like, yeah. here's the thing. It used to cost $60, and now they're $6,000. Right, 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 right. Hold, hold on. I was going to say, I didn't even know anything was wrong with my converters until I got on the internet and then found out they're all shit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jitter. Jitter is the other is another boogeyman, uh, yeah. and jitter is just noise, and it's like 120 dB below. I mean, even on a 
motherboard, you know, real tech sound card that comes in your laptop, your cheap laptop. The jitter is the jitter is noise, and it's like wait, wait. It's wait. did you ever hear the hiss of a CD? Of course not, unless it's analog tape, you know, and you know. Yep. And it's like 20, 30 dB softer than that. I mean, it's just a total, total non-issue. And and but they get these famous recording engineers to say, oh, the the bass tightened up with this clock and it's and the, everything is clear and the imaging is so much better and of course it's just pure bullshit if they really believe it they probably don't have proper acoustic treatment in their in their room yeah <laughs> okay well hey hey just just going off that i mean like how many how many times have you guys actually bothered to do a project at 96 kilohertz i mean like i do impulse responses at that in case anybody <laughs> needs them that high but I, I did at the very beginning. So 2001, we bought a whole bunch of RME stuff so we could try out this 96K thing. And then yeah. uh, I love RME I, stuff, by the way. Wonderful drivers oh, yeah. for the PC. But yes, yes. Uh, they're the best drivers. Period. And yeah. and and that's the whole thing. This, this this idea that there are drivers on PCs and not on Macs. That's not true. <laughs> that's not true in any that's way that actually true. matters. Right. Exactly. All. Because yeah. the the RME is still gonna blow the crap out of the Behringer on 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 the Mac as as just as it does on the PC. And um, if you want access to the higher functions like Total Mix and everything else, those are drivers. And, yeah, uh, I, I just did a driver install last night on the Focusrite Red 16 line into the Mac M1 here. And uh, that that took a couple extra steps because I had to I'll get all these permissions going and whatnot. I was definitely ripping my hair out for a little bit, but uh, it was worth it at the end. And it's like... The M1 chips, okay, hey, you know, I'm, I'm diehard PC guys since like 1992 here. And I got to say, the M1 laptop's pretty fucking impressive. I edited like four, you know, uh, 4K videos yesterday in about three hours. And it, the performance was very impressive. So it was kind of worth it in that end. But that's just going off. About, uh, back on drivers and PCs and converters. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. It's 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 all it's all good information. This is all stuff that's out there in weird ways and and mm -hmm. needs to be clarified because this is where people, this is where I I'm always at. Is I, I hate seeing people telling noobs they got to blow a pile of money on something that they can't even explain themselves. And when they're talking about like Ethan was saying about the clock, mm -hmm. every single term they used to describe the improvement was a nonsense term with oh. with no units. It wasn't like oh it's was, it was plus three dB at this whatever. No, it was right. it was warmer. It was more transformed. It, it was more forward. It was yeah. more present. In the musical, room musical. Yeah. Don't forget musical. Yeah. Oh god, <laughs> euphonic. Yeah, well, it was like, hey, you commented there. Somebody made a comment on the last roundtable. Oh, well, and I've upgraded my converters. They sounded more three D and de and had more depth. <laughs> yeah. And you wrote back, how do you measure that? Yeah, and the yeah, guy's like, oh, I'm not trying to start a war here. It's like, hold on. No, no, no. You're completely full of shit here. Yeah. It's like, yeah, how how did they improve in any quantifiable way? Go. And you get crickets. It's, it's, and, that's... and, you know, if you even if they say, and often they'll say, well, look, I'm not a tech guy. I don't know how to measure, but I can hear it. Well, then the solution is a blind test. And you have to be correct at least five or six times in a row as somebody else swaps this clock versus that clock or whatever it is you're comparing with without the volume changing i mean everything has to be the same and if you can't get it five or six times in a row then you're full of shit and you are now exposed <laughs> and you know and the really sad thing is well, that's why they don't take the test but so. right yes, th th right that's the sad thing is is they don't want to be proven wrong they won't take the test or if you do prove them wrong they get really mad they get really yeah. angry oh, yeah. where they should be thanking Well, that, that was like, that was my tube shooter that I did there last oh, year. I'm like, Jesus. like, let's, let's test all this out. You know, let, let's, let's roll some, let's change some tubes out and reamp and see if there's any kind of difference. We got some amplitude differences, but we did not get tone differences. And that uh, pissed off so many people. I got, I got kicked off a of Facebook amp group for it. Uh, seriously, I'm thinking they were fucking beyond pissed at me for doing this. I had an amp manufacturer call me up and yell at me. What the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, dude. There, there's no fucking tone difference here. It's bullshit. Tubes are designed to be linear amplifiers. What do you want? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, one can resonate a little bit, you know, a little bit here if it's got a longer plate. Okay, then that's fine. But that's not tone. That's noise. Right. What the fuck? And you don't want yeah, that. You don't want that resonance anyway. Right. <laughs> but they should exactly. be. It kills me. But they should be thanking you for the education 
Yes. Rather than oh, some yes. people That's did. Some point. people. Some, uh, a lot of people did. A lot of people were like, hey, thank you so much for you know making this video. It saved me a lot of money. But my favorite exactly. ones, were, were, my favorite responses were, oh well, you just did this for metal tones. Of course you can't hear a difference. So I'm like, well, maybe you should watch the entire video when we ran it through a 1959 Fender. You know, for all you aficionados out there, you know, for the vintage amp snobs, and got the exact same fucking result. Yeah, you're 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 taking on nearly seventy years of accumulated wisdom, which oh. is just it's just a echo chamber is, is a better word for it. Yeah. But you're you're really taking on a, a stuff that that they really believe in, and and what kills me is these manufacturers, they have all the gear in the world to build these things. They understand how to test, mm -hmm. and yet they put these confirmation bias glasses on, and they only hear or see. But if if I'm I'm trying to be charitable too because mm. some of these guys I think they're just completely full of crap. But they they should once you give them this this happened to me. This is my epiphany. I, I was working in a in a big studio and and I was taught I was brought up in that religion that these mic preamps sound a certain way. You have to do this a certain way. Tape is this. Tape is that. And and I was given this tech room with every thing you could possibly use to measure and test gear. And um, I would blasphemously uh this is a dangerous blasphemy is that i actually tested some of the the claims they were making about the difference between two of these mic preamps and we had like good stuff we had a sound tech distortion analyzer every kind of oscope and the difference wasn't there and and the the guys who were there who were helping the adat representatives used, used to tell me hey do the math do some measurements and actually check this stuff and i think you're going to see that these claims you're hearing aren't true, and I just I can't believe it because they're they're insulting the religion I was brought up in. <laughs> uh, but when I tested it, you know, I like you know somebody likes to say I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as I possibly can, and it matters to me whether or not my beliefs are true. And once I got that into my head, um, I couldn't unsee the. That the lies, you know, and I, I couldn't unsee that when you actually test things, you get real answers. And mm -hmm. you may not like the answers, but when you do have the real answers, you stop spending money on stuff you didn't need to spend money on. Right. Yeah, I, I would I would completely agree. I mean, like, like I said, when we were doing the tube test, I had a buddy of mine sitting here and we were testing them out, swapping out. We, were, we just couldn't believe the results we were getting. I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, again, I did the sound is in the hands thing very early on in my channel because I kept hearing that over and over and over again. Sounds in the hands, sounds in the hands, sounds in the hands. So I brought four guitar players in. We all played the same riff with the same guitar, same pick, same everything. And the tone differences were about, yeah, about that much. And it's like, I thought the sound was in the hands. No, the sound's in the gear. And guitar players hate it when you show them that. It's like, you know, and it's like, the next one I want to do a test for is feel. Who's got the best feel? And I know I'm going to do this test. It's going to be hilarious. And um, it's it's definitely inspired by like a James Randi kind of test. You know what I mean? Because that guy fucking ruled. You know, and yeah, yeah. He was the guy who he offered a million dollars if anybody could tell the difference between speaker cables. Nobody won that one. <laughs> Well, he won. Well, you know, I was involved in that as part of the JREF, and, and I had to make a caveat that I told them I could make a speaker cable that you'd be able to pick. So the, the idea is you better not, don't just do it that you can pick this thing blind. It has to be a, an improvement because I could make a broken speaker cable. And sure. that's all that guy would have had to do to, to, right. to really okay. pull this off is just make a crappy sounding, I mean, just throw a diode in there so it clips half the signal, you know. And, sure. Um, so we had to make sure that you know we we, we both agreed that um, the speaker actually sounded good and and at that point uh, you were involved were no in that channel. Interested. Oh yeah, you, you the, the were, JREF you... is. I, I was a big time JREF uh, what, nut. I was, what is I was what is there. JREF? Uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation. Oh okay. It, it used to be a forum. It's called International Skeptics Forum now, and it okay. is not at all the JREF. It is a it's a very feel based. Mm. Religious, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I would call it a religious organization. I don't think they would like that. But okay. um, wow, it's it's not the same as the J Ref, and, and but, they, but they you really were, drummed you, Randy you, out of it at the end. Oh, that's too bad because yeah, I was a big fan of him. Uh, like I said, I thought that speaker cable challenge was just fucking or wire challenge was great. Yeah, okay, that was yeah, the, that, I think that was the pair able one. Yeah, well, 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 hang on. Yeah, let's just talk about cabling here for a minute here while we got a couple yes. minutes because we got to wrap this up in a sec. But let's okay, please. okay, okay. Now. <laughs> 
Somebody just asked me about that. Gold-plated guitar cables. Um, you know, let's talk the difference between, say, speaker cable, mic cable, guitar cable. Okay. Now, I've got this old George Ells cable I bought in, like, 2005. Uh, I was it just does... about to ask when I saw how thin that was. Is that yeah. a George L cable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it had won a shootout for measured capacitance in Guitar World magazine. So I thought, okay, I'll grab one. You know what? Sounds fine. Works great. It's fucking rock solid. Doesn't let me down. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's your take on all that shit? Uh, this is an Ethan one because yeah. I, I'll just go off. <laughs> 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 well, first you have to. There are two categories. One is speaker wire, which has to handle some real current to power a speaker. Mm. You know, hundred watts, right. two hundred watts, even five watts uh, is is actual you know power current. Uh, versus sure. signal cables that are you know micro level or line level. Uh, there's you know the voltage is very low. The current is. You know, microamps, milliamps. You know, sure, exactly. Especially a guitar cable is very, right. very low current. Yeah. Right. So, um, so, so, so those are separate categories, and they have to be discussed mm -hmm. separately. The speaker cable right. is probably simpler because you have power amplifiers that can have enough oomph to drive capacitance. You know, uh, and, right. and 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 speaker wire usually is not shielded. It doesn't have to be shielded. So it can be zip cord. It can be Romex. Uh, when I built right. the biggest, uh, the largest studio in the state of Connecticut. In the late 70s, uh, we used Romex. It had to run you know, 30 feet, 40 feet from the power amps up to the big JBLs. In yeah, the that's what, what I don't get. I don't understand why more people just don't use Romex. It's dirt cheap and it's solid yeah. core. You're not going to get better. Right. Well, of course, it's you know, not that was the, the 11 cent a foot um, cable that we were going to use against pair on the JREF was, uh, uh, yeah, it was from Home Depot. Uh, it was mm. 11 cents a foot lamp cord. Okay. Uh, yep. Well, you know, and so Romex is good for a permanent install, but if it's a portable PA system, you know, the Romex Obviously, is not yeah. flexible. So, you know, so you, so you, you get so you get zip cord or you get, you know, something really heavy. You get extension, you know, 12 gauge extension cord. You know, it's 100 feet that can carry, you know, a thousand watts from your generator to your you know, work site or something, that kind of wire. But so but, but a power amp, a c competent power amp, like something like from Crown can drive even if because the, there's going to be some capacitance especially if it's like 30 40 50 feet but it can a, a competent power amp can drive that no problem and in fact that's even part of the of the spec in all the crown amps i have some power base amps i bought in the 1990s around 1990 so 30 some odd years ago and i recently bought another a crown amp a nine a thousand watt actually a couple thousand if you go into two ohms uh, to power my subwoofer and uh, both of the, uh, the the manuals say this will drive any capacitive load. It will not oscillate. Now, some of the high-end, hi-fi, expensive audiophile crap, like, you know, the $10,000 monoblock amps, a lot of those are not competent, and they will oscillate, and they'll blow your tweeters if you have, you know, the you know, speaker cable that has too much capacitance. But wow. generally speaking, in pro audio stuff with speaker wire, uh, the capacitance is not a factor. So all the wire has to do is just be heavy enough to carry the current. Uh, there's right. a if you uh, there's a website that has a fabulous chart. It's rogerrussell.com. I think there's a hyphen in there between Roger and Russell. And it's a big website with a lot of stuff like my own. But he has like a speaker, you know, wire thing. If you're going this far with this many watts, you know, it's a, like a grid, like a spreadsheet. You're going this far with this many watts, you need this gauge wire and that's pretty much all you have to worry about all right guys we're gonna hold it right there we're gonna be back in a couple weeks and we're gonna start with talking about mic cable how much money should you be dropping on it is there any kind of measurable difference is it really gonna make any kind of difference at all is the silver stuff better or the gold gold plated connectors better any of that that's a question i want to delve a little bit more into and just uh, separate the fact from the bullshit anyway that's coming on the next don't get mad get evidence roundtable with ethan and pipeline thanks so much for being on the show guys i'll see you next time